screen again. All right. Well, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and welcome back to Tannenbaum's World Olympics for All webinar series. Uh, my name is Daniel Del Nido, and I am Senior Education Program Associate at the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding. Uh, I'm looking forward to continuing our conversations about teaching the values of diversity and intercultural understanding through the Olympic Games today. Uh, I'd like to note just as we begin our conversation today that this session is being recorded. Uh, you will be able to access the recording uh, on Tannenbaum's website and on YouTube, I can announce, after today's session is finished. I'd also like to note that I will be taking questions at the end of this session. If you have any questions that you would like me to answer, please put them in the chat and I will address them at the end of this half hour. So we're excited to begin part four of our five part series on using our updated curriculum world Olympics to build behaviors of respect for difference, including religious difference in students. But before I get to that I've got some pop quiz questions for you. So question number one, <laughs> you all are familiar with this by now. Uh, so question number one, uh, which country won the most medals at the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympic Games? Was it A, China, B, the United States, C, Norway, or D, Germany? So which country won the most medals at the 2022 Games? You can put your answers in the chat. So I see some Cs for Norway. I see a D for Germany. Okay. Thank you for your answers. Uh, the correct answer is C, Norway whose athletes earned a total of 37 medals uh, in the course of the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics. Now, question number two. In which country was the summer Olympic sport judo invented? Was it A, Japan, B, China, C, Korea, or D, India? So which country was the sport of judo invented in? You can put your answers in the chat. I see an A, a C, an A, so Japan, Korea, I, I, you got kind of a mix here. All right, so the correct answer is A, Japan in the 1880s. Uh, judo actually made its Olympic debut in the Tokyo Summer Olympics in 1964. So thank you very much for your answers. Hopefully these questions got us thinking a little bit about the diverse sports, nations, regions of the world, and cultures that are represented at the Olympic Games. And the theme of this episode of our World Olympics for All webinar series is how to learn about and celebrate that diversity with your students. Celebrating cultural and religious diversity is central to our work here at the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding. Tannenbaum is a secular, non-sectarian, not-for-profit organization that promotes justice and builds respect for religious difference by transforming individuals and institutions to reduce prejudice, hatred, and violence. As a secular and non-sectarian organization, we're not here to promote religion, nor are we here to denigrate religion, nor to advocate for any particular religion. We're here because religion is an important component of people's lives and identities. We believe that everyone, regardless of their religious or non-religious affiliation, deserves to have their cultures, beliefs, and practices treated with respect. The World Olympics for All webinar series will give you practical advice on how to teach behaviors of respect through the Olympic Games in a way that is fun, interactive, and builds important social and emotional skills in students. Our aim is to make teaching respect easy for teachers. We will show you how to use current and past Olympic events to teach social and emotional skills of respectful curiosity and good sportspersonship to students. We will also give suggestions on how to fit lessons and activities that build social and emotional skills into English language arts, social studies, and even STEM content areas. By the end of this webinar series, we hope that you will be inspired not only to use some of the content that we provide, but also to build on the lessons and activities we discuss and make them your own. This discussion is made possible by a generous grant from the Nissan Foundation. Without their support, we would not have had been able to take the time to develop the unique tips and suggestions we will provide in this webinar series. 
their support has also made it possible for us to deliver these sessions free of charge. As we begin today's session, I would like to take this moment to thank the Nissan Foundation for its continuing support of Tannenbaum's work. Now in today's session, we will show you how to guide student exploration of the diverse nations and cultures represented at the Olympic Games. Our approach builds the study of culture and history on top of foundational knowledge of geography and climate. Accordingly, today's lessons contain numerous links to social studies content areas, while also providing opportunities for ELA vocabulary building. We will begin today by discussing how to teach essential map reading skills through games and examples. We will then show you how to layer concepts of physical geography, such as topography and climate, into student knowledge. We will focus in particular on the relationship between geography and climate. Understanding this relationship will help students identify the differences between the summer and the winter Olympic games and explain why some countries participate in different Olympic events. It will also allow you to connect your discussion to current events such as climate change. The skills and vocabulary students build in today's first lessons will prepare them to conduct research projects on countries that participate in the Summer and the Winter Olympic Games. We will show you how to help students pick countries they are unfamiliar with, guide student research into their chosen country's geography, uh, its culture, and history using both printed and online sources, and to unlock student creativity in building presentations about their chosen country. Today's lessons come from Unit 4 of Tannenbaum's World Olympics curriculum. These lessons develop a number of common core ELA literacy standards of oral and written communication, including building student vocabulary and skills of map reading, including using a compass to locate geographical areas, working in groups to understand basic concepts of climate, as well as the histories and cultures of the countries that they choose to research, and developing both written and oral presentation skills as students report on their chosen uh, country. These lessons also build a variety of social and emotional competencies related to intercultural understanding and to teamwork. Students will manage and motivate themselves to choose a country and to carry out a research project that investigates that country. In doing so, they will work together to divide tasks and gather information. They will also have the opportunity to creatively design a presentation that they can deliver to the class. And with that introduction, let's get into today's lessons. So our first lesson <clears throat> builds foundational skills using a compass and a compass rose to locate geographical regions on a map. Now to begin with, let me start by asking you a quick question. How many of you think that you can locate north, the direction of north, from where, you're, from where you are right now. Put a thumbs up in the chat or raise your hand if you think you can locate north from where you are. All right, I'm seeing a couple of thumbs up here. Thank you. So does anyone who put their hand up want to share how they can find north from where they are? How do you do it? Yeah, Nancy? Um so I know that my window faces the north end of the city. So mm. I know, you know, if here in Manhattan, it's, you know, not too hard to, to figure out, I don't think. Right, when you have a nice grid uh, that, that goes by directions, you know, you know, where you're, you know where you're looking. And you have right. that landmark of the window that you can look to and get a sense of where you are. You can use that to help you orient yourself. Yeah, I was actually thinking about it today. I was thinking I, if I had an African violet, I need a north window. Oh, I have a north window. Like, so actually, <laughs> something that I just thought about today. <laughs> well, great. Thank you so much for sharing. So there are a few ways that you can use to orient yourself. Sometimes there, there's some, some ways involve using stars, such as the stars at night or even the sun during the day, if you can see it. However, the easiest way to orient yourself, if you don't know any landmarks, is by using a compass. You can use your own classroom to help orient your students. Move the desks or tables into a circle 
and stand yourself, have yourself stand in the middle. Distribute a picture of a compass like the one printed on the left side of this slide to each of your students and then hold one up yourself. Go over each of the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west with students. And make sure they notice that the ordinal directions, northeast, northwest, southeast, and southwest are located halfway between each of the cardinal directions on a compass. If you have access to one, use a magnetic compass to find north and have a student or a group of students stand in the, north, uh, the northern corner of the room, or the northern side of the room with a sign that says north. With the sign for north as their guide, have students work out themselves where the other cardinal and ordinal directions are located in the classroom and assign groups of students to put up signs in those locations. You can leave the signs up in your classroom after the lesson is done for reference. You could extend this, uh, this activity into mathematics content areas by having students use a compass rose, like the one on the right side of this slide, to measure the angles between different compass points. Now it's worth it to distinguish between a compass and a compass rose for students to help them connect the orienteering they do in this activity to the map reading they're about to learn. Ask students if any of them are familiar with either of these terms, compass or compass rows, and solicit definitions from students. These are a couple of sample definitions you can use in case no students have experience using either a compass or a compass rows. <clears throat> Be sure also to make sure that students recognize the difference between the cardinal and the ordinal directions. You can reinforce this vocabulary by handing students a world map or distributing a world map to students with some locations such as countries, continents, or even cities that are marked out on it. Ask students which direction they would have to travel to go from one location to another. And if that direction is a cardinal direction or an ordinal direction. One way to tie the Olympics to this discussion directly is to choose locations where summer and winter Olympic games have been held. Ask students to construct travel routes between the cities. Working with a map is also a great way to introduce the next part of this lesson, where students will learn how to find specific locations on a map. So one of the best ways to introduce map reading to students is through games that involve locating items on a grid. Now, does anyone know what game we're showing on the left side of the slide here? What do we have? Battleship. 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 Exactly. Now, follow up question. Can anyone describe how you play the game Battleship? I can, but it would take too long to type. Sure. Yeah, go for it. So you try to strategize where your opponent's ships are by asking them questions based on a grid. Right, absolutely, perfect. And you try to sink your opponent's ships. Exactly, right. Like you, so you play Battleship by guessing squares on a grid, right, on where the other player's ships are. And so the first person to hit all the other ships, all, all their opponent's ships, wins the game, right? So you put your ships on a grid. And like all grids, a battleship grid is organized according to vertical and horizontal lines. And each line is assigned a, assigned a letter and a number. So in order to play the game and guess where another player's ships are, you need two pieces of information, right? You need the letter that indicates what vertical line the ship is to be found on, and the number, which tells you which horizontal line the ship is on. You could convey this information to students with an actual game of Battleship if you have access to one. If you don't, World Olympics contains a paper grid with the same information. You can show this sample grid that we have on the right side of this slide to your students. As you can see, it has three triangles sort of representing the ships on it, right? And you can have uh, students play their own game of battleships, right? Have students tell you where the ships are using the you know, vertical and horizontal lines of the grid, 
or divide them into pairs and have them create their own game of battleships. You can even use a blank grid for that. The goal is to have them practice locating something on a grid using vertical and horizontal lines. Once students have practiced locating, locating items on a grid, they'll be ready to repeat the process on a map. So pass out uh, to students a map of the world with lines of latitude and longitude that are printed on them. Take some time to explain to students the vocabulary that lets them identify the vertical and the horizontal lines on a map grid. It can be helpful to have students look at the map and the battleship grid side by side to connect the two visually. You can work through map reading vocabulary with students by asking them if they know what the vertical and the horizontal lines on a map are called. You can also direct their attention to the vertical and horizontal lines running through the center of the world map and asking them if they know what those lines are called. Alternatively, you could provide definitions of each of these terms and have students locate them on the world map. Now, <clears throat> just like the vocabulary related to reading a compass and a compass rose, the vocabulary for map reading is technical. It's important, therefore, to have students practice using map reading vocabulary by locating places on a map. So we recommend having, uh, starting by having students use lines of latitude and longitude to find areas on the world map. So for example, you can ask students on what continent they would be if they were at 60 degrees west and 20 degrees south. They'll find that they're on the continent of South America. You can then bring in the mathematical skills students practiced when they learned about using a compass rose ask students where they will be if they travel 80 degrees east from their original position in South America. They will see that they are now in Africa. Make sure that students practice traveling in both cardinal and ordinal directions as well. If students travel 60 degrees east and 50 degrees north from their new position in Africa, ask them where they will end up and what direction they're now going in they'll find that they have traveled northeast into Asia. So each time students travel across the map, ask students a few questions about their journey. Ask them what new line of latitude and what new line of longitude they've, they've arrived at and in which direction they've gone. Also ask students if the new location they've traveled to is hot or cold and whether they would be better off wearing heavy or light clothing when they go there. These questions will help anticipate the discussions of climate students are about to engage in. So this is just one way to have students practice map reading. If you want to connect students map reading to the Olympic Games directly again, you can have them locate Olympic host countries or host cities. You can either give them the coordinates of different host countries and cities and have students locate them on the map, or you can add host countries or cities to the world map and have students identify their approximate coordinates. Students can create a chart of different locations where the Olympics have been held and where they are located in terms of latitude and longitude. You can also send students on a scavenger hunt across the world map. Give them starting coordinates and then a list of directions and distances expressed in terms of latitude, longitude, and compass directions. Have students provide the coordinates of each location that they stop at, as well as the continent and even the country that they're in. You could provide a separate map with country names with no lines of latitude and longitude for students to refer to as they complete their hunt. This activity can also help you extend a social studies unit on immigration. The Pew Research Center has data on the top birth countries of immigrants to the United States. Have students locate these countries on the world map and provide approximate coordinates for them. Alternatively, you can assign students to interview their family or a friend on their ancestors' countries of origin. Students can then locate these countries on the world map. Now, our second lesson today introduces the concepts of climate and topography to students' understanding of geography. 
In doing so, students will learn basic concepts of physical geography that help them gain a better understanding of the summer and the winter Olympic games. A great way to connect the Olympic games to physical geography is by looking at different Olympic sports. Have your students do a quick quiz and see if they know which sports are played during the summer and the winter Olympic games. So let's do this together. I'm gonna list a few different Olympic sports. Write down in the chat whether the sport I mentioned is played in the summer Olympics or in the winter Olympics. Okay, so number one, gymnastics. Is that a summer Olympic sport or a winter Olympic sport? All right, I see summer here. Okay. Number two, snowboarding, summer or winter? Great, winter. Number three, biathlon. <laughs> so I can see some summers, though one summer with a question mark and a winter. Okay. Number four, weightlifting. So I see a couple summers here. All right. Number five, bobsled. Seeing some winters. All right. And finally, number six, track cycling. Is that a summer sport or a winter sport? Okay, summer here. All right. Thank you very much for participating in this quiz. So let's look at the answers here. So we can see here that gymnastics, number one, is a summer Olympic sport. Snowboarding and biathlon, numbers two and three, are both winter Olympic sports. Biathlon is a sport that combines cross-country skiing and rifle shooting. Number four, weightlifting, is a summer Olympic sport. Bobsled, number five, is a winter Olympic sport. And finally, number six, track cycling, is a summer Olympic sport. Now, having gone through the answers, let me ask you a follow-up question. When you look at the winter Olympic sports on this slide, do you notice any features that they share in common? All right, I see a need snow in, in the chat, cold. Great, thank you. So you're absolutely right. One thing that each of the winter sports has in common is that they all take place on snow or ice. And uh, I see Dolores, who just put this in the chat, another feature that many, though not necessarily all winter sports share is that they take place on a slope. So let's go one step further here. Put these two features of winter sports together, that they involve snow or ice or cold, and that they often use a slope. With these facts in mind, let me ask you one more question. What kinds of geographical location would be best for playing winter sports? What kind of a place would you want to go to if you wanted to play a winter sport? Cold place? <laughs> cold mountainous climate. <laughs> now snow is manufactured, that's true. And we'll come back to that, it's a good point. But you're absolutely right. <clears throat> you know, winter sports are best played or the most easily played in cold locations that are hilly or mountainous. So just going through this really quickly together shows us how looking at different sports and what you need in order to play them helps us understand a little bit more about the relationship between sports and geography. The World Olympics curriculum contains a complete list of summer and Olympic sports as of 2020, which allows you to explore this connection in a lot more detail. And you can connect this discussion on sports to the previous lessons map reading exercises by asking students to predict whether countries are more likely to participate in the Summer Olympics, the Winter Olympics, or both. Have students generate lists of geographic features of different countries that are better for winter sports and other features that make it more likely for a country to play Summer Olympic sports. Ask them to predict at what lines of latitude 
both north and south of the equator, it will start to be cold enough to play winter sports regularly. You can even activate prior student knowledge of physical geography by asking them to fill in their maps with mountain ranges, major rivers, tundra, and any other geographical features that they think might be relevant to playing sports. Wrap up your discussion of the relationship between sports and geography by providing students with the definitions of climate and topography. These definitions are once again technical, so it'll probably be necessary to provide students with the proper definitions rather than having students develop definitions for themselves. However, if you're working with an older group of students, consider asking them if they're familiar with the concept of climate or the concept of topography and where they might have heard of them before. You can ask, uh, you can use the geographic features students have just identified to help you explain these concepts to students. Write the two terms, climate and topography, on the board or on a piece of chart paper, or if you're teaching remotely, on a jam board or another sticky note program. Ask students to go through each geographic feature they identified earlier and state whether that feature is related to climate or to topography. So with this, base, uh, this, this basic knowledge of climate and topography, students are now prepared to look in more detail at different regions of the globe. The next part of this lesson has students research different geographical regions to determine what kinds of climate and topography are found there and how physical geography impacts the sports people who live in each region play. So the World Olympics curriculum contains a handout with brief descriptions of the five major types of climate, tropical, desert or dry climate, moderate or temperate climate, continental or Mediterranean climate, and polar climate. <clears throat> we recommend showing students a world climate map like this one, or the one included in the World Olympics curriculum to illustrate the different types of climate. If you want to further reinforce student understanding of latitude and longitude, you can have students look at a climate map side by side with the continents map they have been working with so far. Quiz them on their knowledge of latitude and longitude by providing them with a set of coordinates and asking them what climate they would find themselves in if they went to that location. Once students are familiar with the different types of climate, they'll be ready to investigate the relationship between sports and geography in specific regions of the world. To give students an opportunity to look at one region in depth, we recommend a jigsaw approach to this activity. Divide the class into groups and assign each group to research the climate, topography, and sports played in each region. To deepen the investigation further, instruct groups to choose five or six countries from their region to see if that country has sent athletes to the Summer Olympics, the Winter Olympics, or both. <clears throat> now, the World Olympics curriculum gives extensive guidance on how you can craft the research component of this lesson, including providing examples of regions to assign to students, as well as worksheets with questions for them to fill out. You could use the research materials contained within the curriculum or design a research assignment of your own on this topic. If you decide to have students consult outside resources while conducting this research project, we, we, we recommend curating a list of trustworthy sources. Appendix H of World Olympics contains a selection of print resources that you can direct your students towards, though you might also consider including both print and internet resources in your list of recommendations. If you have access to a library, either at school or in your area, you can consult the librarian for recommendations or even organize a visit. Give each group an opportunity to report orally on their findings to the class. Then bring the class together and ask them for any conclusions they have about the role climate and topography play in what sports countries play based on their research. Also, have each student create a list of countries that they either research or heard about in oral presentations that they are unfamiliar with and would like to learn more about. This list could become the starting point for our last lesson today on researching the culture and history of a country. Just one note though, if you're interested in connecting this lesson to current events social studies content, consider including a discussion of the impact of climate change on Olympic sports, particularly winter Olympic sports. 
the articles listed in this slide are appropriate for sixth grade reading level and above and give insight into how rising temperatures and greenhouse gas emissions are making it harder to find sites for the Winter Olympics. One particularly striking fact is that only around 10% of the snow at the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics was natural snow. The other 90% was artificial. Oops. Now today's final lesson brings together the knowledge of geography, climate and topography and sports that students have acquired so far and allows them to research a country of their choosing. We recommend having students choose a country that they're unfamiliar with. You might also consider allowing a student who is a recently uh, arrived immigrant the opportunity to present their country of origin to others in the class if they are interested. The goal of this lesson is to build bridges between students of different cultures and backgrounds and for students to draw connections <clears throat> between their own cultures and societies that they're not familiar with. It's a good idea to begin this research project by having students brainstorm research questions that they can ask. Doing so allows students to take ownership of their research projects and focus on questions that interest them. So a good question to start with that you could pose to students to get them thinking about researching other countries is about what if someone visited the United States? What are the most important things that your students think, that it, your most important things a visitor should know when they come to the United States? You can work with students to formulate research questions that can guide their projects into their chosen countries. The World Olympics curriculum also includes a worksheet with a set of research questions that you can use instead. The next step is having students choose the country that they will research. You can organize this process in a number of different ways, depending on the size of the group you're working with and whether they're putting on an Olympic Games of their own. If you are working with a single class, you could divide your students into groups and have them come to consensus on what country they would like to study. You could retain groups from the previous lesson and have them decide on a country within the region they study, or you can create new groups and have students share the countries that they wanted to learn more about from the previous lesson and decide on one to investigate. With a larger group, like an after school program or an entire school, Groups, you might want to have groups coordinate with each other to ensure that each group is researching a different country. You might consider having groups rank their top three choices and resolving any duplications through negotiating or through a game like a coin toss. If students need more ideas on countries to research, you can have them look at past Olympic opening and closing ceremonies, like the ones presented on this slide. Have students look at photos or footage of these ceremonies and write down elements they notice that they have some questions about. This can also be a helpful way for students to think of more research questions for their projects. Finally, if your students are in the process of putting together an Olympic Games of their own, this is a great opportunity for them to choose a country that they will represent at their own Olympics. Make sure that your students choose countries from as many continents as possible to match the diversity of the Olympic Games. The World Olympics curriculum provides a number of ways for students to organize and present on their research. Students who need ideas on research questions for their country might benefit from a what I learned about blank worksheet like the one shown on the left of this slide. Another alternative is for students to create a poster project or wall decoration about their country. You can then set up a poster session and allow students to take turns circulating the room and hearing from other groups. As they circulate, students can fill out an Olympic passport with uh, information on each of the countries that they visit. Now, depending on the age and the number of your students, completing research projects can take up to two or three class periods. Ask students to give suggestions on what kinds of sources they should consult to complete their research, atlases, encyclopedias, internet sites, and others. Consider organizing a trip to your local library, either at school if you have one or in your town or city if it is e easily accessible. 
If you've already consulted with a librarian about the previous lesson, you can ask them to work with students to create a list of sources for studying the culture and history of different countries. Now, if you're working with a large group of students of multiple ages, this project also provides an opportunity for students to take on leadership or mentorship roles. In general, you can expect younger students to take a little longer to complete this research project than older students. So once older students have completed the assignment, consider assigning some of them to join groups of younger students to assist them in their work. They can help them take notes on and organize the information they acquire from their sources or to make sure that they answer all their research questions. Finally, once it's time for students to give presentations on their countries, consider inviting members of the school community or even students' families to view them. Putting on a viewing event for the students' research projects is a great way to begin your Olympic event if you're putting one on. The pictures on this slide come from past presentations students working on World Olympics have created. And you can see how creative the presentations can be. On the left are Olympic flags for the countries students researched. These were put up as part of the school's Olympic Games. If your students create flags like these, they can become part of a wall decoration at your school. And on the right are poster presentations students at another school created. Notice how students wrote text, found images, and created models for their presentations. Creating presentations is an excellent opportunity for students to express and celebrate the diversity not only of their interests, but of their talents. Presentations of student research on different countries bring together and celebrate all of the aspects of diversity students study in Unit 4 of the World Olympics curriculum. Designing and carrying out research projects gives them an opportunity to practice the skills they have learned throughout the unit. By choosing countries from different regions around the world to research, students will celebrate the geographical diversity of the nations represented at the Olympic Games. And by looking into their past and present, students will also better appreciate the cultural diversity at the Games. Acquiring information about this diversity will require students to use the skills of map reading, as well as the vocabulary of climate and topography they acquired during the first lessons of the unit. Applying these skills will allow students to see for themselves how climate, sports, and culture are related. And as a final note, try to include opportunities for students to appreciate, or to appreciate the similarities and differences between the cultures they investigate. After they have completed their presentations, for instance, you might consider bringing students together for a concluding discussion on features that were common to different cultures. You might also have them create lists of things they learned about the countries whose presentations they visited that they didn't know before. And be on the lookout for opportunities for students to take on mentorship and leadership roles throughout the process of completing their Olympic research projects, especially if you're working with a large group. And that brings us to the end of today's episode of World Olympics for All. Our fifth and final episode taking place on March 18th will show you how to put on your own Olympic Games. And as a reminder, any participant who attends all five webinar sessions will be entitled to a one-on-one -on -one meeting with myself and other education staff to discuss implementing the World Olympics curriculum in your classroom. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and your participation today. And I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. One question. Yeah. Last week, something came up about if there was going to be information about either the Paralympics or Special Olympics in the curriculum. Um, and it's something I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing um, if it's there. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that question. Um, so there will be material, first of all, next week on the categories of, uh, you know, of, of, um, of, of impairment or disability that are recognized by the Paralympic Games. And this will give a great opportunity for students to think through the diversity of talent and ability and interest that they can bring together in their own Olympic Games. Another way to extend some of the lessons that uh, we talked about today are by looking at Paralympic sports and how they're related to uh, you know, standard Olympic sports, right? How uh, different adaptations of these sports are made in order to, you know, 
make accessible these sports to athletes of different ability statuses. Um, that's another way of extending this, but we'll have more on that on next week's as well. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, it was great to see all of you and uh, have a good afternoon. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Great. Take care. Bye, guys. Have a good Bye. weekend. Bye. Bye. Thank you.